wild, majestic, powerful. Bison are creatures of the prairie. They're not domesticated livestock, and we're here to learn the unique considerations required to raise a species that has evolved with Iowa's natural ecosystem. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Megan Filbert, and I'm with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Accompanying me behind the scenes and providing technical support is Jorgen Rose. We will shortly be broadcasting live with Martha McFarlane in Fredericksburg, Iowa, but first, just like an old movie, we'll roll the credits. We'd like to thank our partners and major sponsors, both level A sponsors and our level B sponsors for helping make 60 virtual events possible this season. And guess what? You can attend or watch recordings of all of them free of charge. So thank you sponsors. Practical Farmers of Iowa is a community of over 4,000 members committed to building resilient farms and communities. We're a farmer led nonprofit based out of Ames. We specialize in farmer to farmer knowledge sharing and farmer led research. Learn more about PFI and access our vast collection of resources at practicalfarmers.org. This virtual field day will run for an hour, will end at 3.15. If you have questions during the field day, please type them into the comment box and we'll relay your questions to Martha. Also, at the end of this event, please give us your feedback via the online survey that I'll chat a link to in the chat box. We'll post this is the first time, this is our first time going all virtual and with your feedback, we are excited to learn and improve. So we'll turn it over to Martha and then at the end, we'll have a lot of time for Q and A and even get to see some live bison in Martha's field. So, all right, with that, Martha, take it away. Hi everybody. Um... I want to thank you so much for joining in today. Um, I um, very often um, over the summer will get calls from people who are interested in raising bison. So I had talked to Megan earlier in the season saying, hey, I really like we're having a technical difficulty. Martha, you're muted. Can you unmute? Sorry, guys. So Let's can you just start from the top I because it cut know. out? Totally will, yes. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Martha. Um, I will um, tell you a little bit more about myself and my farm, but um, I was sharing that um, I every summer get phone calls um, and people who are interested in potentially raising bison. So I had talked to Megan uh, quite early in the year, maybe sometime around January about hosting a field day so people could come out to my farm with that particular interest in mind. Um, of course, then COVID hit and it felt like kind of a disappointment that we weren't going to get to do this in person. Um, but what I discovered um, as we started figuring this out, um, as I started going out just to videotape my bison specifically for a virtual field day, bison don't always do the coolest things on command. Um, so I'm actually even more excited now that we're doing this virtually because it's allowed me to string together some videos and some things um, that you normally wouldn't get to see if we were just in the wagon driving around the farm. Um, on top of that, um, the bison have really coordinated and cooperated with us today. I shouldn't say coordinated because it was a happy accident. About an hour ago, they came up to the pasture just right outside my house. So at the end of the session, we're gonna go out um, and do our Q&A um, with a little bit of live time with the bison as well. So my hope for you today is just to reach out to those people who are considering like 
gee, do I want to raise bison? I am definitely not an expert by any means. I've been doing this for about nine years, really actively above and beyond just doing the bison tours that we do. Um, but my hope is, is that at the end of it, you have a feel and that you can get connected with some great resources. I'm a member of the Minnesota Bison Association. There is no Iowa Association. The Minnesota Association really functions as an association for the upper Midwest. And um, every year they do a session um, at Thanksgiving time um, with Dale Rangstorf, who is a former president. Um, he has 30 years of experience and that will go even more in depth than what we're gonna be doing today. So with that, Megan, if we can advance to our first slide. So um, our operation involves myself and my father, Dan. Uh, Dad is 87 years old. Um, and as I was saying, I came home about nine years ago to run our family farm. We have about 50 bison, uh, 20 pulled Hereford cattle, uh, mostly cow-calf pair. Um, with the Herefords, we sell live animals, and I've just started um, selling beef directly um, in a farm store as well. And with the bison, we do a mix of live animal sales, we sell meat, and we also do agritourism. So people can come to our ranch to tour, um, to kind of learn a little bit about our farm, and particularly to go out and to see the bison. We can advance. So our farm is a heritage farm and um, we have about 130 acres of deep woods and pasture, um, savanna and open grasses that the animals uh, run on. Um, in addition to that, we have about 60 acres of crop ground um, that we just cash rent, corn and soybeans, traditional conventional farmer rents that ground from us. And then we also have about 40 acres of hay um, where we produce the hay that we feed the bison in the winter time. Can advance. So when I start talking to people, I think the very most important thing I want you to know if you're wondering if you should raise bison is that bison are not cattle. So um, scientifically, um, if you're looking at research, um, cattle and bison, they can interbreed. You may have heard of a beefalo. It's awfully hard to get that to happen and very often an animal that's produced is sterile. Um, but when we're looking at research, there's not always a lot of bison research out there. And so we do defer to cattle a lot in that way that they're, they are similar. Um, but I feel like personality wise, they're so different. And that's really an important thing to consider when you're comparing bison to cattle or when you're considering whether or not you think bison would be a good fit for your ranch. You have to remember that cattle have been domesticated for thousands and thousands of years. I love my Herefords and my Herefords need me very much, especially in the springtime when it comes to calving. Um, bison, on the other hand, have evolved as part of the prairie ecosystem. So you're looking at an animal that really takes care of itself in many ways. So with that, we can um, play the video. When you talk about comparing bison to cattle, I think this is a good uh, demonstration of how they're different. So this is an urban spring, and um, it's kind of a grainy video, um, but the bison uh, had gotten into the hay field and there was a hole in the fence between the hay field and the soybean field. And I don't know if you can see very well, um, but this is bison is jumping my fence. He totally gets it. Uh, but this is a five foot fence. And the only reason he biffed it is because it was at about a 45 degree angle. Um, bison are super fast and super crazy. And we can talk about that a little bit more, but they can stay on nose next to a regular fence and just like hop up over top of it. Um, so um, that's something to consider, but um, we'll go ahead and advance and think about this when we're talking about the fact that bison have evolved as part of the prairie ecosystem, um, they take care of themselves. So in addition to being ninjas, in addition to a lot of the intuitions that I feel that bison have that cattle, my cattle miss sometimes, um, we really in the industry refer to this as the bison advantage. Um, bison do not need barns. They are incredibly weather tolerant. Um, you'll notice in this picture, I picked it specifically because snow oftentimes collects on a bison's back. And that's because they're so well insulated, it doesn't melt. 
Um, bison will also eat snow as often as they'll come up for water. Um, this, in this particular picture, this is a pasture um, that's back, oh, maybe the length of a football field away from the waterer. Um, and I could see because of fresh snow on the ground, they didn't come up um, from that grazing ground for three days. They were just eating the snow um, as they were grazing. Um, I had an, uh, somebody tell me once that um, they did a trial. Um, it's a for, the former president I was talking about. He said that they had done a trial with bison in North Dakota and in Colorado looking at weight gains through the winter. And what they recognized um, was that there really was no difference in the weight gain, despite the fact that, of course, North Dakota has so much colder winters. Um, you really just... Um, have no problems um, with the snow and the bison. At 30 below zero, I'm worrying about my cattle. I'm not necessarily gonna be worrying about the bison. Um, they'll face head into the wind instead of butt into the wind and they will actually walk towards uh, the storm in order to move through it. Of course, along with that, what I was just describing is that efficiency with feed. Uh, another old timer who raises bison said, yeah, the great thing about bison is you can just throw them any old hay and they still gain weight. Uh, I know that there have been studies done too, just even looking at weight gain with corn, um, and, and they didn't see a big enough difference to justify why you would feed corn versus feeding um, other things with bison. Um, a bison will eat about 3% of its body weight each day, so that is something uh, to consider as you're figuring out your numbers with bison. Uh, my favorite bison in the herd right now is about... 15 to 17 years old, and she has a calf every year. Um, bison are um, certainly longer lived uh, than cattle, and they will um, have calves. They can live to be 30, um, and you regularly hear people who have um, bison cows um, that are anywhere um, between 28, 29 years old uh, in that mix. And along with that, when you consider that bison have evolved as part of the prairie ecosystem, if an animal had trouble calving 2,000 years ago, that animal died off. We don't worry about handling the calves at all. Um, a cow um, takes care of having her babies on her own with bison. Um, they really do need very little handling. Um, most of the work that I do on my farm is actually maintenance, maintaining the fences. And we do a once a year roundup um, where we give the animals a wormer, um, an injectable wormer, and then of course we'll pull off the calves or who we're gonna sell. Um, but other than that, the bison stick together in a herd. We have a mixed herd where you have um, both bulls, cows, and meat stock all together. Bison go into a rut, so you don't have to worry about when um, they're breeding. And um, we always get calves in the spring. You can advance from there. So, of course, you were probably interested in how you would be making money with bison. And so I thought this was an effective chart um, to give you an idea of um, the differences in prices. It's important to keep in mind um, that your average bison is going to go to market between two and two and a half years old. Um, but also um, I was really coming home 2009, 2010 um, and into the spring of 2011. And as you can see at this point, um, we were really feeling it um, in terms of price and the market um, that it had dropped quite significantly than the years prior to 2008. Um, one of the things to really keep in mind with bison is that uh, there are over 40 million cattle in the United States right now and less than a million bison. So there's an untapped market that producers like myself cannot keep up with demand. Um, along with that, I think it's important to recognize that we're quite a friendly industry, um, that there is no need um, for competition or trying to elbow each other out. Um, I think many people who start out here will remark on how helpful everyone is um, in getting other people started. We can advance to the next slide. So these are some live animal prices. Um, 2000 and um, 19 proved actually to be um, 
kind of a down year for us, but we had kept saying, as you even look at those carcass prices that we were due for a downturn, um, that demand was getting higher and higher and that prices were getting higher and higher. So on this, a year where prices were down, heifer calves um, were selling between 700 and a thousand dollars, depending on whether it was a judged or a non-judged animal. Non-judged um, for calves um, might be market bound. Um, it might also be someone who's buying breeding stock, but of course the judged consignments are the best of the best um, that people submit um, during the sale um, in November. And um, bull calves are always going for at least $1,000, as you can see in both the judged and the non-judged. I really felt like it was worth also pointing out mature cows, um, because at $1,300, um, that mature cow was just due for slaughter. And I know for sure when I take in my Hereford cows for slaughter, we don't get prices as good as that. And we can advance from there. So one of the reasons that bison um, are in such high demand right now is really the health benefits of the animal. A lot of other consumers are also interested in the fact that um, most bison are coming from smaller producers, not um, giant feedlots. Um, and um, there's also an environmental impact to be considered um, when you're talking about eating bison meat. But bison meat is, um, much healthier um, than conventional beef, um, even a little healthier than grass-fed beef. Um, and when you're looking at the animal, you know you can see the numbers on these charts here comparing fish um, and beef, um, but when there is a bison steak and the skinless chicken breast, you've actually got less fat in that bison steak. Um, it has less cholesterol, but the cholesterol that it has in it is um, higher in LDLs or the good cholesterol. Um, so it's really packed with protein. Someone who doesn't want to eat a lot of meat, um, it's super nutrient dense. Um, so those are some of the reasons why we're seeing such a surge in interest with bison meat. I think it's worth saying right here, um, like, so my, uh, my bison meat right now, my bison burger is going for $10 a pound. And, um, we are sold out right now before we're going to get in um, to our next uh, locker equipment. And we can advance. So this all sounds great. You may be wondering, what am I getting into? Um, the picture on the left, um, I have uh, the guy's name. This is someone from one of my bison groups on Facebook. I um, solicited some photos. Um, I guess the good news in raising bison is that when I tried to find the crazy videos and the crazy um, pictures, I didn't have very many <laughs> or any or enough to share with you guys, um, which says a lot, I think, about their personalities, that it's not so crazy or so nuts. Um, but this is a good demonstration of um, some of the challenges or the considerations in raising bison. Um, they can, in a smaller enclosed space, um, jump maybe even as high as a 12 foot fence. But it's also important to recognize that when they're out and they have uh, their elbow room, um, that they're pretty laid back. Um, so every, um, every um, operation is gonna be different. I think that's something, uh, you know, as I wanted to do this presentation, um, but some of the things, if you're wondering, does this work for me or not, is um, that every heifer, bison heifer, is going to be three years old, not two years old, before having its first calf. So when you're getting into the business, it takes a little longer to get started. As I said before, um, meat animals um, are going to be ready at two to two and a half years old. Um, another important consideration is if you would already have sheep or goats. So sheep or goats can be a passive carrier for a disease. Um, we refer to it as MCF or malignant called the Harthal fever. And um, it is, um, a pa it's something that can be passive in sheep and goats, but it can actually take out an entire bison herd. So sheep and goats and bison do not mix. Um, and ultimately, when you're thinking about caring for the animal or what you're going to do, um, really the very most important thing is that they're going to need parasite treatment. So you're going to want to round up 
typically to do a parasite treatment. There are strategies that you can use to leave them in the field, like a safe block, uh, a safeguard lick block, um, but it's not consistent enough, I feel, um, to really hit your animals if you're, you're having any trouble with parasites. And most old timers will say, yeah, if you're ever seeing something going off in your herd, it's probably parasites. And the reason for that is that thousands of years ago, um, an animal would come through this area and then not hit again for two years. So of course that would break its own parasite cycle, whereas we're only on a hundred acres. So animals are hitting um, the ground um, over time um, and that's where that can happen. Um, another consideration when raising bison is that um, they are very herd oriented. Um, I've had some people contact me and say, oh, like, I don't want to spend all that money on bison meat. Like, can I just like buy a calf from you? Um, but bison are so herd oriented. If you just had one animal, it would not thrive. I feel like it wouldn't thrive or be healthy for that animal. And then within your bison herd, there is a real hierarchy within the mix. Um, so that's something worth noting. Um, sometimes when you're figuring out where you put your fences, a bison will tear through a fence, never because they're mad or they want to get something, but if they are trying to get to the rest of the herd, they just don't care about anything else. Um, as far as um, regulations um, in terms of meat, um, and if you wanted to, to sell meat directly to the public, in Iowa, there are very few regulations. Uh, in Iowa, um, bison are considered a non-amenable species, which essentially puts it in a category that is not beef, um, poultry, or pork. Uh, and um, we do a field harvest, which I'm really grateful for, and I think is a lot, keeps everyone a lot happier and healthier on the day of the harvest. Um, but at any time, it's hard to say if that would change, you know, so I think that you would really want to um, defer maybe to USDA rules or certainly, especially if you're out of state, check in. Um, I think it's time to maybe play the next video. Generally speaking, um, bison, when they're in a herd, are always pushing and shoving and knocking each other around. So the thing that's really important is that you don't want to get down in the middle of the herd. Now, right now, I was feeding diatomaceous earth. That's what they're checking out here. And um, I am right next to the truck, ready to jump into the truck at any time because I'll, I'm zoomed in here, but I'm fairly close. Um, when we're working with the bison, we always stay on the outsides of the herd or try to stay back um, as far as we can from the animals, um, just because you can see how quickly they move or how quickly you might need to get out. Maybe switch to the next video then. So I would say that generally speaking, um, if I'm going to be working with my animals, um, I definitely don't ever want to get into the middle of the herd. At the same time, uh, it's definitely worth noting that I can move them on foot by myself, um, that they're not super aggressive. Having said that, I think you need to know that each herd is also very different, that I'm very comfortable with my herd because um, 
over time, we've established our own understanding and our own relationship. If I were to walk down into this um, field um, and still being very, very far away from the bison with a group of people, that's something that's different or unusual for the animal. And you would just see the whole herd go running um, before you even had a chance to get close. Uh, but this would be an example of me that day um, when the bison ended up in the soybean field in the early spring, um, the kind of movements that I would have to do to get them going. Hey. Hey. Also in the middle of the day and it's really hot, so the bison didn't want to move. And you can see me over there on the left. A lot of times because the bison know me and I know them, it's almost easier to try to work the herd by yourself or with one person than if we brought in 10 people. This is a 30 acre pasture on our farm. It's the middle of the day, they're pretty chill. There's not really a lot going on. Um, bison, more than anything, like that elbow room. I don't know that I would ever want um, any bison in a pasture that's less than like five acres um, with the kind of fences that we have. And I'll talk about the fences in a little bit, but our fences are right about five feet. And as you can see, they're just high tensile. I think, um, as you're watching me move them, um, I am really watching their behaviors. And um, there's a cow in here. I'm not sure if we get to this. Maybe it's this girl um, turned around and facing me. When If she doesn't turn, if they don't turn, then you just wait for them to make the decision. You don't push them any further. It's really important to me always to have that safety bubble around me. And I have found um, that I've had animals or I've known producers who want to get down right on the ground next to the animal to feed them, to give them some cookies or treats. And I just feel like that is not safe at all because you never know how fast a bison can move or what could happen. And I know of one producer in particular who, you know, the, the bison were like his buddies and he thought they were great and he ended up getting hooked by a horn. So. Um, I'm always going to keep at least, at least 10 feet, but probably more like 20 to 30 feet between me and the bodies. So thank you for that, Megan. Can we um, move on um, to the next slide? So you see me out there with the herd on an easygoing day. Um, it's really important to consider that a bison in the wild wants to turn and wants to run away. That is their defense in the wild. Um, they can turn on you or they could be aggressive, but typically that's gonna happen in a time or space when they feel trapped or they feel like the threat is not going away. Um, the number one consideration when you're raising bison and you see the tail go up, that is your cue that you need to get out of there, not stick around and stand down a bison. Um, so I have these pictures that I had to pull off the internet because I don't even have any pictures of the bison raising their tail at me. Um, but there have certainly been times in, in the mix where I'll see that tail go up and that's just the time to back way off. In any of these cases that you hear at Yellowstone, I feel like it's a situation where the people have not backed off. I would never ever, looking at that picture of the bison and the people on the trail, keep walking down that trail when I saw that tail up um, and how close they are to the bison. Um, so while they can be aggressive, I, I feel like bison can also do a really good job telling you what they're thinking. At the same time, you have to recognize that they can make a decision before they've had time to read what they're trying to tell you. So that is the consideration um, when you're looking at bison. But when I'm out in the, the pasture, just like the video I showed you, you, I want everyone to recognize that you can just, um, like you need to be back or you need to back off. It, it, you're not gonna keep pushing or you're not gonna keep doing something with the herd. Um, also the, the language of these bison with their heads down is saying a lot, um, which I'll see oftentimes before the tail. 
Now, having said that, I was looking for any pictures or video of my bison and the best I could get for you is, is this is my herd bull. Megan, can we run this video? Um, this was the same day that the bison got out. They got in the hay field then they went to the soybean field. I walked them back. That's when the one cow was, or the um, one bull was jumping the fence. And then this is my herd bull who's pretty laid back. Um, and this was the day he was not laid back with me. Really? We're gonna play that game. I'll play it with you. So I yelled at him and I ran him down, but I ran him down with my Subaru. It's not something that I was gonna do um, by myself. His behavior's here, his head dips down, his tail switches, he's coming towards me. He's the one saying like, no, I'm not gonna do what you wanna do. So um, anyway, that's, yeah, bison bull being a jerk is what I labeled that video because that's what he was that day. So we can go to the next slide. Does anybody have any questions? I feel like I've been talking for an awful long time. No questions in the chat box yet, Martha, but I have a question for you, sure. which is if you do sell stock, mm -hmm. breeding stock, whatever it might be, would you sell them in family units because they are such herd animals? You know, typically people want to buy um, younger animals. They're going to either be looking for, um, for calves or for one and two year old heifers. Um, it's ideal because bison do live in family units, uh, but it's also tricky to get an old bull um, off of the farm onto a new farm um, where they really know and consider that to be home. So the recommendation actually is typically that you would want to buy um, like a two-year-old or a three-year-old um, or a yearling to get started so that they start to connect and understand that that is, is their home. Um, that a lot of times if people are having trouble with their fencing or with animals breaking out, it may be like a case of somebody who brings in um, an older animal. Um, having said that, once you start that herd, then you can start to develop those same family dynamics within the herd. Thanks. That's really helpful. And it's just important to consider because it is a lot different than other species of livestock. I think you might be froze, Martha. Okay, Martha, unmute yourself. You're back, but unmute yourself. There we go. Great. Okay. And on the right, um, we have um, a, um, a two-year-old bull, one that's just about ready for slaughter, the one that says A. Um, and then 40 would be um, in that same age group of a two or three-year-old. Um, actually, that might be a yearling, um, one of my yearling heifers. So can we advance to the next slide? All right, fencing. This is the important part, right? Like what's gonna keep in a bison? So the pictures on the left are fences, new fences that I've built on the property. Um, and they are right around, I'm gonna say like five, five feet, maybe a little bit higher than that. Um, I know some producers since I've built these fences who recommend six feet. And I think any future fences that I would build um, for the bison that are exterior fences, um, I would be building a high tensile fence at six feet. Um, and then what we do is we will um, electric um, like two lines, but I know other producers who do all electric on those high tensile. Now that's out in the pasture. That's say, let's say like five acres or better um, for an animal to be on lots of elbow room. The picture of me on the right, I am 5'3". Um, and uh, behind me is one of our catch pens for the roundup for when we handle the bison. And a two-year-old bull jumped over the board of that fence and actually bent um, the part of the gate that you can see um, bent down there. So um, that was not a tall enough fence um, for a two-year-old bull um, at roundup time who was in that gate.
So I think that's also worth noting. So we'll talk a little bit then about bison handling. Um, if you are gonna do a roundup, um, when you're gonna to gather the animals, um, you're gonna need a different handling facility, which will probably be the biggest expense when it comes to raising bison. You can throw bison out on any pasture. You don't need the, the shed, you don't need things like that, um, but you're gonna to wanna to consider your, your, your handling facility. The difference in a bison handling facility than just a traditional, anything that you'd be using for cattle is the crash gate, which you can see on the bottom picture on the left. Um, that's a crash gate. That's, it's a door that swings forward around the head gate so that when the animal is coming through the gate, it hits the crash gate and it backs up. And that's when you can use, um, um, that's when you can, you can pull down um, and catch the animal in the head gate. You're never gonna be able to catch an animal um, moving forward through that head gate. They're just too fast. Um, the other important components um, are, is that protection for you. So as you can see in that top picture, that's my dad in the red scarf. Um, everyone on the ground there is protected by some board fence and then the bison that spits out of the um, where the head gate is, is on the other side of that fence. And my dad is standing on a catwalk. So there's a catwalk there um, that you use to like get anywhere close to the animals. Also on top of the alleyway, it's protected with bars so that the bison can't jump up. Now I've had a yearling bison, which you can remember in that mix is one of the smaller bison in the herd, um, poke their horns right up to where dad's face is, right up if his hands were on there, then the horns would actually end up hitting his hands. So um, I don't think I'm gonna talk a lot about the bison handling facility as much. It's just if we can skip through some pictures so everyone can see those. Um, everybody decides how to put their facility together differently. That middle picture there is those is that protection. So none of the animals when they're in the alleyway can jump up and out of there. Um, the picture on the left is um, the crash gate that's on and I'm waiting for that animal to come forward enough to hit the crash gate and then move back and then that's where I'll catch it. Um, we do this so we can tag the bison. Um, and then like I was telling you uh, before, we also do a shot. Um, bison have really thick skins. They actually have skin that's like three times thicker than cowhide. Um, so it's often recommended that you do an injectable wormer um, and not a pour on for bison. Um, and the picture on the right, um, that is just a fun story. That's a cowboy friend of ours that comes and helps us. Um, for all of the craziness um, that may be the roundup day when you're bringing these animals into a small enclosed space, um, it's not so much that they're aggressive, but I would say you have to think about a bison like you would a deer. And imagine bringing a deer into your living room and what that deer would be like. And that pretty much defines how bison are when they get into smaller enclosed spaces. Um, so having said that, and for knowing that we always are as careful as we can be and take all the precautions we could, we had a moment where my friend was standing um, and pushing the bison, the whole herd down um, because we work on breaking off the animal from the herd and the herd turned around unexpectedly. Um, and he had the guts, bless his heart, to just stand still. Um, I think if he had moved, he would have been trampled to death, but by having the guts to just stand still, the entire herd didn't trample over him, but they all went around him. So there's this component to raising bison that I find really interesting in that they are very kind of sensitive um, to the landscape um, and, and the elements around them. So um, I don't know, it makes a good story for how bison are just so intuitive and very different than cattle. So with that, I think um, maybe we can just look at the last pictures and then head on to the next steps. So then this is us just tagging the animal and then there you see um, the crash gate open again when we're um, spitting them out into the herd. And really, um, as we're talking about bison behaviors and if um, we haven't scared you off today and if you've seen the numbers and you feel like, wow, it is certainly an adventure and it's pretty amazing. I feel like, um, the bison are such amazing intuitive creatures that consistently I am, I am just in awe of them. I think I've got them all figured out and then they do something else that's just so cool that you never would expect. Um, I highly, highly recommend um, 
joining the Minnesota Bison Association. I am certainly biased. I am a member um, and I loved it so much that I'm on the board, um, but it's really inexpensive. Um, I believe it's $60 a year for a membership. Um, it's a local, it's um, an organization that's focused on this region. Um, the National Association is really wonderful as well. It's just, it's more expensive and you're gonna get um, producers from all over the country. You know, and of course our experience experiences can really vary. Um, so I think joining um, a regional organization really helps you just by getting a bunch of other producers in the room to ask questions. Um, our Thanksgiving um, weekend sale um, is an opportunity that you could even just tune in online right now to look at some of the animals. Um, and as I said, we do a Bison 101 class. Um, also, we always do a spring education conference in April. So we don't really know what this world is gonna look like um, in April, given COVID, um, but that is something to consider. The National Association has also just done some, um, some new videos. So I think that that would be a great place to go and start looking more in depth into what you would be interested in. Um, and then they also do a winter conference. Um, they do a summer conference as well. So maybe by next summer, they'll be doing that. And then I threw on the Canadian Bison Association as a great link, just because they have a lot of great um, research articles, which has been really helpful for me as I'm thinking about, you know, how you would treat an animal or what, what you do with them. Generally speaking, I just love um, the book Last Stand, uh, George Grinnell, The Battle to Save the Buffalo and the Birth of the New West. Um, it great, gives a great history of the animal. It also talks a lot about how bison were on the brink of extinction um, in around 1900 and how, of course, they bounced back to what they are today. So with that, I, um, I don't know, do we have any more questions, Megan, or should we head on out to see the bison? Yeah, I'd love for everyone to type questions in the chat box this is the time for it. And I'm curious, Martha, do you want me to play that last video of the friendly cow in the woods? Oh yes, absolutely. So you saw my bison bull being a jerk where he's dipping his head and he was moving around. Um, this is more typically what I'm gonna run into when I run into my bison in the woods. This lady is looking for a treat. So you can tell she does, her head is up, her ears are forward. She's licking her lips. That's how I know she wants a treat. Um, and quite often what we're really gonna see when we're hanging out with the herd. I've got nothing because I'm, over, I'm fencing. So eventually she just takes off. Okay. So Martha, do you want to head out to the pasture? I'm heading out now. I'm getting Great. ready to join the group with my phone. I'll see you guys out there. Perfect. And let us know what questions you have for Martha. Okay, Martha, can you unmute yourself from your phone? Oh, the perfect. Yes. There we are. Sorry, I thought I had. Okay. See the bison? I have a question for you. Yeah. Yes, we can see them. My question is, can you explain the difference between using the term bison and buffalo? That's a great question. Um, scientifically, a bison is bison bison. Historically, um, when French fur traders were coming west, they saw the bison and they referred to them as les bouf, meaning beef uh, in French. Um, and somehow that got confused with buffalo. So scientifically, a buffalo would be a water buffalo or a cape buffalo like you would see in Africa or in Asia. 
Um, but it was a historic nomer that is stuck. And so a lot of times we'll refer to the bison as buffalo or the American buffalo just because, you know, we have that romance and that history. Um, but scientifically, it is a bison. Thank you. I, while we wait for questions to roll in, I wanted you to speak a little bit about selling bison meat and your marketing of, of my meat products. Yeah. So, you know, our agritourism business is really closely tied to our, our, our meat sales. We are about an hour North of Waterloo, um, which would be the biggest metropolitan area, um, for us. Um, so I think that, um, I, this is a, an operation that I've inherited from my dad. Um, he started raising uh, bison in the early 90s. And I think particularly, you know, that long ago, it was really hard to convince anybody um, to just like come up and buy some bison meat. So having the tours has been a big part of our sales. Now, you know, I can certainly say over the years, even um, in talking with people, uh, it's gone from, oh, I might try that. I'm not really sure to, oh, bison meat. We tried that. We love that. Um, and so in, in recent years, we're definitely um, doing more um, direct market sales, um, just specifically to customers who are coming to pick up the meat. Um, and then I'll also do deliveries for orders over a hundred dollars as well. Um, but we also, we choose to sell mostly individual cuts um, from a store here on our farm. Um, and then I would say we do maybe two or three wholesale bison a year where someone buys a half um, or a quarter or even a whole bison. Thanks, Martha. Yeah. And Martha, go ahead, Jorgen. We a question here from Facebook. So there's a question about fence for Mitch. And the question is, why do you use high pencil electric fence rather than like a or I'm sorry, rather than what? Rather than like a seven or eight foot non-electrified fence. Uh, it's easy to put up. <laughs> um, I know that there are some producers um, who um, will use um, big wooden posts and some net fencing. Um, the Bison 101 session that Dale Rangstorf does in the fall really hits on the different styles of fencing um, and which one might feel like a good fit for your business. Uh, but this fencing works for us. You know, I think I just, I've never had any trouble um, with the fencing that we have. Um, when I was talking about that bison intuition or the guy who just stood there and the bison go around them, um, the bison aren't looking to challenge a fence. They're not going to look at it unless there's something really good on the other side and they're hungry and they can't get what they want um, at home. Um, so our focus, you know, especially with raisin meat is we just make sure they're well fed and they're happy and they're not um, going to challenge the fences that we have here. So Martha, we have another question from Jordan. How do they react to cattle dogs that try to round them up? That's a great question. Um, I will say that I am on, so I'm on a, a Facebook group called Bison Bison. And so every, and it's a really great opportunity because, you know, my experiences with bison or with dogs may be different than someone else has heard. Uh, there's this picture of a bison and the dog just hangs out with the bison. Uh, that has not been my experience at all. Um, I have no fear of walking out um, on the fringe of this herd, like you saw in the video. Um, but if I have a dog next to me, um, they will, a bison is not going to look at me and just suddenly turn and charge on me. Uh, but if I have a dog with me, it's very likely that that could happen. Um, they definitely, um, I think a dog that's too much like a wolf or a coyote, and, and they think of that as a predator. Um, also, having said that, though, um, I have a funny story of um, a family, the road. You can see where the red gate is right there. So I had um, a couple once who just stopped on the road to look at the bison and they had a dachshund in the back seat of their car and they rolled down the window to look at the bison and the dachshund jumped out of the car to chase the bison. Um, I would have predicted that that dog would have gotten rolled or knocked into the way that they treat my dog, which is a lab. Um, but instead, I guess it didn't look enough like a wolf. It scared the whole herd. So I had 50 bison way, way back into the end of the pasture and realized I had this lady here and this, this, uh, little wiener dog that was pretty much 
between me and the farm there chasing after the bison. Okay, Martha, how many acres should you have per bison? Is there a rule of thumb around that? Um, in terms of grazing, I'd say it's about the same as cattle. Um, I, my, my cattle are definitely always hungrier. You know, like if I take out um, a bale of hay to my cattle, it's gone uh, by the next day. If I take a bale of hay out to the bison, they'll eat on it and then they'll go do other things and then they'll come back to it. Uh, the timing of how much how much they eat is about the same, but not how quickly they eat it. Um, but I'd say a general rule of thumb would be like one or two acres per bison. Your bigger concern is gonna be um, the size of your fences. I think if you had say five bison, I would want five bison on five acres just for the elbow room um, as much for this type, this style of fencing. Um, Martha, um, can you talk a little bit about aggression during the breeding season? Great question. Yeah. So when bison go into a rut, um, they do have a tendency to be a little bit more, um, aggressive. Um, I would say, I mean, we still do tours during the rut, um, and have not ever experienced any concerns or problems, um, in terms of the bison, um, being more amped up or something like that. But I'm going to be really, really careful anytime I ever see um, what you start to see in addition to a bull chasing um, a cow around. You don't ever want to get in between that. But you'll also see the, the two bulls um, or three bulls that you have in the herd duking it out um, and butting heads. Um, if you're seeing animals butting heads or you're seeing the bull chasing the cow, you, I wouldn't be um, pushing the animals in the same way as you saw in that video. Okay. The, the, that would be a time that they could be aggressive. Sure. Um, Mitch asks, how important do you feel it is to live on the same land as your herd? Would having the herd live 10 or so miles away work? Uh, if you have good fencing, it would definitely work. Um, I know producers that have multiple herds in different locations because sometimes it's hard to buy land um, that's adjoining yours. Um, and it certainly works fine for them. Cool. Um, a couple different questions about what your pastures are comprised of. So when you decide you want to get into bison, do you need to prepare your ground by seeding Iowa natives? And can you talk a little bit about what's in your pastures? Weeds. <laughs> so what you can see right here, this is um, the area where they have the water um, and their mineral um, and it's definite, and you can see there's patches out there where they, uh, they roll and they wallow um, and they dig up and then they, they get tired of a wallow after a while and they leave it behind and then that becomes the weed bed when they start a new one. Um, you definitely don't need to start with Iowa natives. I think any, um, any kind of uh, traditional pasture would work just fine. Um, the thing that you'll find, or that I find at least, is that my bison are much pickier than my cattle on what they'll eat. Um, so I end up with more weeds. Um, so I am really working hard on this. This is a 30 acre pasture that we've just in the last um, year, and I'm trying to get them used to the fence now. Um, I doubt you can tell from here, but behind the herd um, is there's a new fence. So I'm gonna start doing rotational grazing with the bison, but they've just been wide open to this 30 acres um, since we started in the 90s. Um, and we'll have stuff growing up here, burdock. Uh, they really don't seem to want to eat that in the same way that my cattle do. Down in the woods, we've had a lot more multiflower rose growing. Um, so you can certainly use bison to manage your herd. Um, and the good news is, is that you'll also get more wildflowers and, 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 and native prairies and, and a more diverse species in your pasture, but you're also going to end up with more weeds. So Martha, there was a question about rotational grazing. What is your plan? How big will your, will your paddocks be? How often will you move them? That's a great question. You know, I think if I were starting fresh, it would be really interesting, you know, with a young group of animals, but what I have is animals that already have patterns and systems. So what I'm working on, I should have done this from the get-go and I forgot. Sorry about that guys. Um, is that this is a, but basically between me and, and the barn that you see down there um, is um, an elbow of a 30 acre pasture here. Um, 
bees back here and, and the pasture snakes around. And um, I'm gonna divide this 30 acres into three pastures, but I'm gonna do one fence a year. So I'm doing this fence now. I don't even have a gate on it to get them. Sorry, I got somebody coming on a four wheeler. Can you turn it off? Turn it off, please. That's okay, just turn it off. Okay, thank you. So, um, so one fence a year. So I've got the fence line here and I'm just getting used them used to that. There's not even a gate on the end yet. I'm not gonna close them in. I'm just getting them used to that pattern. Um, and then I'm gonna build the next fence next year. Down in the woods, um, they have um, 110, well, they have about 80 acres down there. And, um, and I'm gonna put a fence line down there next summer. Um, and we're working on a watering system for that. So for me, it's more of a matter of like shrinking the pastures to see how much they can handle it. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. Yeah. Okay, we got a bunch more questions and five minutes left. So here we go. Um, do people still talk about beef genetics mixed in with bison? Is that a factor in breeding? You know, it comes up a lot. Um, they, I know that, I, I believe it was the National Bison Association that did, um, that did a study um, of uh, animals where they drew blood and, and in most of the herds, um, it was a big number of bison that they studied and they, and they found a very, very small percentage of any herd. Like, I, I don't wanna say it was less than 5%, but please don't quote me on that. Um, but it was ridiculously small. So we hear a lot, I think, um, about people having a pure herd um, as something that, that maybe a, um, a native prairie um, organization might feel really proud of. But at the same time, it just seems like it's not as much um, of a consideration um, in a producer's world because it, when they were tested, there just weren't that many there. Um, I've also heard that there are cases then where um, they've had a, he a herd that was genetically pure without, um, without any beef genetics in it, um, but some of the calves ended up with some of those genetics. Um, and there's some supposition that perhaps that actually is from a lineage that goes way back um, to the precursor, you know, when we talk about bison evolving as part of the prairie ecosystem, um, you know, we're not just talking about uh, 10 or 20,000 years ago, but um, even as much as 50,000 years ago or earlier. Um, so there's some thought that maybe that's where some of the cattle genes come from. Cool. Another question. Um, are there, so what's the minimum herd size you would want to start with? Four or five. Okay. And then kind of related, if you have a herd of 50, roughly how many calves will you get a year? Um, ideally you should be doing probably an 80% breeding rate, but a lot of that is going to depend on, um, the quality of your pasture. And if you even decide to supplement, if you don't have a high enough quality pasture, my beef cows, my Herefords, um, get pregnant pretty quick and will hold on to a calf. Um, a bison, uh, 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 your birth rate is a pretty good indicator of, um, of, of their health. Um, they take care of themselves first before they get pregnant. So if your animals aren't flush enough, um, if they're having, you know, if they're just a little underweight, um, you're going to have trouble with that birth rate. Martha, how many do you harvest at a time? We do one at a time. So we'll do a field harvest, um, which means that we shoot them out in the field. Um, we have a big loader tractor um, that we come out with once we shoot the animal and we lift it up and we bleed it out. And then we put it into the back of a pickup truck and we take it to um, our locker. Um, we time our harvest um, to make sure that we're not doing it in the middle of July, but it's in the late, late fall um, and in the early winter. Um, and yeah, we'll just do one at a time because for our locker, um, they have the one day that they do it. We've done two before but it's hard to coordinate um, with our locker. I, I feel like it's not as fair to them um, because sometimes they have to wait around for us depending on how, how well the, um, the harvest goes. Ruth says, this is so infor informational. Are there people in South Central Iowa working with bison? Yes. Um, certainly. I would recommend anybody who's interested to just email me and I can certainly connect them. Um, if you go to the, um, the Minnesota website, or there's also an Illinois website, 
um, an Illinois Bison Association. A lot of times producers that live in Iowa because there's not an Iowa Association belong to these other Midwestern associations. Um, so you can also look for people that way. Martha, do you mind if I uh, chat your email in the chat box? Hawkeyebuffalo at gmail.com. No Perfect. Problem. Yeah. And we are at 315. So for those of you that need to leave, thank you so much for tuning in. But I'm going to dive into just a couple more questions here. Um, sure. So one was about like, um, is there any time when you need a tranquilizer gun? Do, do you use it at Roundup ever? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I've never done a tranquilizer. Um, I would, I think I, I am the bison don't handle stress in the same way a cow would. And so I think I would be really concerned about that. I do use a, I have a dart gun, um, that I bought because, um, our setup is that um, that red barn you see behind there, that's where our sorting facility is. And this is where the bison pasture is. And there's a gravel road going in between. Um, so to treat one animal is quite a challenge. Um, someday, maybe I'll get that sorting facility moved. Um, so I have a dart gun that I've tried using on occasion, but what I've found is that, you know, what, what I'm gonna treat is maybe an antibiotic in a serious case or a multi-min or a, um, a wormer and those are pretty big darts. So you still have to get so close to the animal. Um, I haven't had a lot of luck in being able to, to shoot it and hit the animal. And then that releases the, the medicine um, when you shoot the dart. Um, and then that dart's done. Um, and a lot of times it bounces off the animal. So you can do that. But um, I also got a pump gun, not um, not a dart gun. New dart, P N E U dart would be the company that you would look into. And um, in my experience, I should have probably done the the CO two cartridges. I might have had better luck. Sounds kind of wild. <laughs> um, okay, I Mel asks. To pick up basically. <laughs> Try to get close. Mel asks, "What do you do with the skins of harvested animals?" Yeah. So um, everybody will make a comment. Any people on tours, you know, my customers will say, oh, I would love to have a bison hide. And they are amazing. Bison fiber with the winter hair is in the same category as cashmere. It's so soft. You would never believe it when you're looking at this big old shaggy beast. Um, so everyone likes the idea of a hide, um, but to have a hide tanned um, and tanned well will probably cost you 15 to $20 a square foot which means that most bison hides will go for about $1,000, but I'm not making very much of that money. So um, I happen to do rendezvous a lot, which is um, which are guys doing old timey things. Uh, I've had a lot more luck just selling um, the salted hides for a hundred bucks to somebody who would be interested in tanning it themselves or finding the tanner themselves. Okay, Martha, one last question. And that is, is there any sort of cost share available for this like fencing and watering infrastructure? Have you worked with NRC? That's a great question. This fence is an, e not, well, not this fence, but the fence behind it, the new fence I put up is an equipped fence. Um, and so there are cost sharing programs for, um, for putting in your infrastructure. Um, I'm putting in a water system because this is my only waterer here in the winter time. Um, and then we have a creek that's a water source in back. And so in order to start working more on rotationally grazing with my bison, um, I'm, I'm putting an above ground watering system in this summer. Um, and that is all um, has been part of an equip program. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you so much, Martha. You are a wealth of information and this was incredible. So for all of you tuning in, thanks so much. Thanks for hanging with us during some technical difficulties and please fill out the evaluation that would really help us and contact Martha. If you want to continue discussing with her, ask her more questions, her emails in, in the chat box. So thanks again, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you.